Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Dan Friedel. This program is aimed at English learners. So, we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear stories from John Russell and Brian Lynn. John tells us about good news from a center started by former US President Jimmy Carter that works to end a painful disease in Africa. Brian has a story about light pollution that is making it harder to see stars in the night sky. Scientists say it is getting worse than they expected. Then Katie Weaver and I bring you the higher education report. If you are thinking about coming to school in the US and want to find a way to earn a little money while studying, you will want to listen to this episode. And then, if you like to listen to words and their stories on a device you share with others, you might want to call First Dibs on playing this week's episode. And now, here is John Russell. The Carter Center said recently that only 13 human cases of guinea worm disease were reported worldwide last year. That is a major drop from 3.5 million cases of infected people in 1986. These early numbers are expected to be confirmed in the coming months. Still, the Carter Center founded by former U.S. President Jimmy Carter and his wife Eleanor Rosalind Carter, said the last part of the international effort to end the parasitic disease will be the most difficult. Guinea worm is a disease that affects poor communities in distant parts of Africa and Asia that do not have safe water to drink. People who drink unclean water can get parasites that grow up to one meter. The worm grows in people for up to a year before painfully coming out, often through the feet or other sensitive parts of the body. The World Health Organization, WHO, says there is neither a drug treatment for guinea worm disease nor a vaccine to prevent it. Guinea worm disease can be prevented by training people to filter and drink clean water. In 1986, the Atlanta-based Carter Center joined the WHO and UNICEF in the fight against guinea worm disease. The center said the remaining infections occurred in four countries in sub-Saharan Africa. Six human cases were reported in Chad, five in South Sudan, one in Ethiopia, and one in the Central African Republic. The Central African Republic case remains under investigation. Adam Weiss is the director of the Carter Center's guinea worm eradication program. Weiss told the Associated Press that the final efforts to eradicate or completely end the disease could be difficult. Weiss said the populations where guinea worm still exists often face insecurity, including conflict, which can prevent workers and volunteers from going house to house to offer support. Weiss cautioned if support for these communities slows or stops, there's no question that you're going to see a surge in guinea worm. He added, We're continuing to make progress even if it is not as fast as we all want it to be, but that progress continues. Guinea worm could be the second human disease to be ended after smallpox, says the Carter Center. I'm John Russell. A new study has found that light pollution is making the night sky brighter 
and the stars dimmer. The study examined data from more than 50,000 citizen star watchers across the world. It found that man-made or artificial lighting is making the night sky about 10% brighter each year. Data for the study was collected from 2011 to 2022. The research findings recently appeared in the publication Science. The result was a much faster rate of change than scientists had estimated in the past. We are losing, year by year, the possibility to see the stars, said Fabio Falci. He is a physicist at the University of Santiago de Capostela in Spain. He was not involved in the study. If you can still see the dimmest stars, you are in a very dark place, Fauci said. But if you see only the brightest ones, you are in a very light-polluted place. As cities expand and put up more lights, a sky glow is created in the sky. Sky glow is a term scientists use to describe light that becomes more intense. Christopher Kaiba is a physicist at the German Research Center for Geosciences in Potsdam. He was a co-writer of the study. He told the Associated Press that the 10% change was a lot bigger than he had expected. The research team gave an example to explain the result. If a child is born where 250 stars can be seen on a clear night, by the time that child turns 18, only 100 stars will be seen. This is real pollution, affecting people and wildlife, Kaiba said. He urged policymakers to do more to reduce light pollution. Some communities have set limits. Past studies involving artificial lighting used satellite images of the Earth at night. They had estimated the yearly increase in sky brightness to be about 2% a year. But the satellites used are not able to identify light with wavelengths toward the blue end of the spectrum, including light given off by energy-effective LED bulbs. The researchers noted that more than half the new outdoor lights put in across the United States during the past ten years have been LED lights. The satellites are also better at finding light that gets spread upward, like a spotlight, than light that spreads out from side to side, Kaiba said. Sky glow affects human circadian rhythms as well as other forms of life, said Georgetown University biologist Emily Williams. She was not part of the study. Migratory songbirds normally use starlight to orient where they are in the sky at night, Williams said. And when sea turtle babies hatch, they use light to orient toward the ocean. Light pollution is a huge deal for them. Falci, the physicist at the University of Santiago de Compostela, said part of what is being lost is a universal human experience. The night sky has been, for all the generations before ours, a source of inspiration for art, science, literature, he added. I'm Brian Lynn. 
The cost of attending a college or university in the United States is very high. Education Data Initiative, an organization that collects data on the U.S. education system, says the average college student spends more than $50,000 each school year. Some international students receive scholarships or financial aid, but many have to pay full price and often need to work outside of their class and study hours. The U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement Agency says students on an F-1 visa are permitted to work both on and off campus as long as they follow certain rules. Students can also get experience with American work culture by volunteering for organizations outside of their study area. Learning English recently spoke with two international students about what they learned about American culture from their jobs. Kushi Agnish from India recently finished her undergraduate studies at Quinnipiac University in the northeastern state of Connecticut. Agnish received a scholarship from Quinnipiac, but she needed a job to cover extra costs. She got a job making public opinion research phone calls for the Quinnipiac University Polling Institute. The poll researches a wide range of topics, such as tensions between Russia and Ukraine and New York City's new mayor. Agnish said she made up to 100 phone calls a night for the work. One thing she learned was how to confidently speak on the telephone with Americans. She said sometimes Americans had trouble understanding her accent. People just think if it's an Indian person calling or if they're talking to an Indian person, it's probably a scam. Other than that, a lot of times people were actually really nice. Agnes also worked at the Campus Technology Center and volunteered at a hospital as a sexual assault counselor. At the Technology Center, she helped people who had computer problems, like lost files. At the hospital, she helped people who said they had been assaulted to contact the police and fill out paperwork. Agnes said she learned that in America, people are not just sitting at home or telling girls to sit at home. She said that is different than in India, where many women do not go out alone because they are concerned about rape. I was glad I could help in some way, she said. Tony Yantong Chen just completed his undergraduate degree at the Eastman School of Music in Rochester, New York. He is now applying to study for an advanced degree in piano performance. He came to the U.S. from New Zealand with a strong background in classical music. Along with piano, he is a skilled string musician. Chen said the best jobs at Eastman for piano players are saved for graduate students. He could do things like work in an office or direct people to their seats during musical performances. He chose not to do those jobs. Instead, Chen got a job with rock music to teach young students from Rochester schools how to play music in an orchestra. Many of these students lack a musical background and do not know how to talk about music. I had to change my vocabulary to make it accessible and help them improve, he said. When certain students even just show up, um, that, that will really please me. So 
uh, I think in general, it's just really celebrating small successes. Like other international students, Agnish and Chen's work experience gave them extra money and added to their understanding of American culture. But one professor who studies education had a warning for international students. Do not let your work prevent you from completing your degree on time. Walter Ecton is an assistant professor at Florida State University. He and two other professors recently wrote a paper on students who work while attending college. The paper noted that students who work are about 20% less likely to complete their degrees than those who do not. He said the best amount of work for students is 5 to 10 hours a week. Ecton said it is likely that international students who work while going to school learn a good deal about American culture, new kinds of people, and work routines. But they need to be sure they do not put themselves in a bad situation by delaying their progress. For international students, many of them are paying really large amounts to be over in the United States. They need to work to support themselves, but they also want to get their degrees as quickly as possible. If the students can finish on time and move on to the next part of their lives, a little bit of work can be, as Chen put it, a way to get out of the music school bubble and feel more integrated into the community. I'm Katie Weaver. And I'm Dan Friedel. Thank you for your help on that story, Katie. You're welcome, Dan. I learned a lot. But I have some other questions for you about the international students with jobs. The music student, Tony, said it is easy to feel as if you're in a bubble at a school like Eastman, where the study program is very serious. What did he mean by that? Katie, that's a good question. Some of the best music students in the world go to Eastman, and they center their studies on music and practice and rehearse a lot. Many spend all their time with other music students and professors. That is the bubble he talks about. By working with rock music, Chen is able to interact with all kinds of people in the city of Rochester, enjoy new experiences, and learn about things beyond the bubble. True. Sometimes bubbles need to be broken. One more question. One professor seemed concerned that students who work in college might let their educational careers suffer as a result. What are the students you talked with doing now? Well, Kushi, the student who worked for the Quinnipiac Poll, she is now working as a research assistant at Yale University, which is nearby. She is studying treatments for a kind of skin cancer called melanoma. And Tony, the piano player, is getting ready to try out for music programs that will give him an advanced degree in piano. He will travel to famous music schools such as Juilliard in New York City and Indiana University. Both of them got the most out of their American education and employment, to be sure, Dan. Thanks again for your help on the story, Katie, and the good questions. Anytime. I'm Dan Friedel, and you're listening to the Learning English Broadcast. I'll be back with the rest of the show in just a moment. And now, words and their stories. From VOA, Learning English. Words 
see if you can guess the meaning of first dibs from the following exchange. Hi, I was calling about the house for rent, and I was wondering if it's still available. Yes, well, it is empty at the moment, but I can't rent it out yet. My nephew is interested, and he's got first dibs on it, so I'm waiting to hear from him. Oh, okay. Do you know how long it'll be until he decides? Um, you know, it could be a month. I'm not really sure. Here, the owner is giving his nephew a chance to rent the house before anyone else can. Having first dibs on something means having the right to get something before anyone else. We can have first dibs on one thing or on one or more things from a collection of objects. For example, you can say, She has first dibs on the World Cup tickets. In both examples, note that we use the preposition on before a noun. American Dictionary publisher Merriam Webster says the expression first dibs likely comes from a children's game called dibstones played in 17th century Britain. Children would try to catch small objects like pebbles on the backs of their hands. The objects were called dibstones or dibs. By the early 1900s, get first dibs was in common use in American English. Here are the verbs we often use with the expression. You can have first dibs. You can get first dibs. Someone can give you first dibs or you can give first dibs to others. And when you call first dibs, that means you claim possession even if nobody said you could choose first. If you call first dibs, you should only do so if you think other people probably do not want or care about the thing you are claiming. Otherwise, people might view you as selfish or not respectful of the rights of others, and that could create conflict. Can you think of something you'd like to have first dibs on? You can let us know in the comments section. Until next time, I'm Andrew Smith. Thank you, Andrew. I'm Dan Friedel, and you're listening to the Learning English Broadcast. Andrew, let me call first dibs on offering congratulations on producing a fun episode of Words and Their Stories. Thanks, Dan. It was fun to do. So, Andrew, you talk about getting first dibs on the opportunity to rent an apartment. In some cities, that would be quite an advantage. What's something in your life you've had first dibs on? How did it work out for you? Well, actually, I can't remember. And the reason I can't remember is first dibs is usually for something pretty small or not too important. And that's because for important things, we usually don't just let anybody pick uh, what they want. But on the other hand, there is an example every day from our work at VOA Learning English. Every day, the writers at VOA Learning English have a choice of four or five news articles that they can choose to write. So when they choose one or claim one, you could say they get 
first dibs on that news article. You're right, Andrew. That's a good example. I'm a big sports fan, so I usually call first dibs on the sports stories whenever they come up. Dan, I wonder if there's a situation you can think of where first dibs might not be a popular call. Well, I guess the first thing that comes to mind would be getting the first chance to do something risky. Maybe I would not want to call first dibs on jumping off a bridge into a river. For that, I would want to see someone else jump in safely first. That seems like a good one, Dan. No one wants to go first when the results could be hitting rock bottom. Thanks again, Andrew. We hope everyone finds something to call first dibs on this week. Maybe you will call first dibs on listening to the Learning English broadcast tomorrow. We're always glad you are listening. Thanks to all my VOA colleagues for their work on today's program. To review, we heard from John Russell about the work to eliminate all cases of guinea worm disease in Africa. The Carter Center says the number of cases have declined by a large amount since the 1980s. However, even though there were only 13 cases last year, it will be difficult to completely end the painful disease. If you look into the night sky and wonder if the stars are not as bright as you remember, you would be right. Brian Lynn told us that in most parts of the world, light pollution is making it harder to see the constellations. A report says the amount of light pollution is increasing faster than expected. Later on, Katie Weaver and I talked about two international students who found success with their studies while doing some fulfilling jobs at the same time. And then, Andrew Smith brought us this week's words and their stories. We learned where the term first dibs came from. I've been calling first dibs my whole life, but I never knew why. If you want to keep learning English with fun stories from around the world, I hope you listen to the program again tomorrow. Visit the Learning English website for more. You can find us at learningenglish.voanews.com. I'm Dan Friedel.